Welcome to a lecture about the short story, The Five Orange Pips, a Sherlock Holmes story by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's short story, The Five Orange Pips, is one of the 56 Sherlock Holmes mystery tales. This one, as with nearly every other Holmes piece, begins in the London environs, particularly in his office at 221B Baker Street. As always, the tale is told via the narration of Dr. Watson, Holmes' assistant. The first-person view from a narrator who is not the main character allows the reader to feel an intimacy with the characters and situations without revealing the mind, and thereby spoiling the mystery plots, of Holmes. Specifically, Watson is writing about cases in the past with Sherlock Holmes, mentioning several between 1882 and 1890, until he settles on recounting this one from 1887. Mind you, the first Sherlock story was set in 1882 and continued through 1893. However, Doyle was writing stories about Sherlock from 1887 to 1927. This places these selections in the modern era, but as these are quintessential, infallible detective mystery tales, they follow that genre's format rather than necessarily adhering to any modern era writing expectations, although certainly some are inadvertently fulfilled. It is a particularly stormy night when a young man arrives whose name is John Openshaw. He is British, and his father, Joseph, had worked and made good money in the bicycle industry, while his uncle, Elias, had owned a plantation in Florida, returning to England with a fortune after the Emancipation Proclamation. John makes no bones about the fact that his uncle was a temperamental, unfriendly drunk, who was not well-liked by anyone but John. Apparently, Elias had a soft spot for his nephew and had always shown him kindness. In 1883, John is present when his uncle Elias freaks out when a letter containing five dried orange seeds, or pips, is delivered to him with a signature of three Ks. Mysteriously, Elias pulls out a brass box full of papers, which he burns in a fire. A few months later, Elias is found dead in a puddle of water in his backyard. The death is deemed to be suicide, and Joseph, John's father, inherits the property. In 1885, this process was repeated with Joseph, the letter, the pips, the signature. Included is the statement to leave the papers on the sundial. His father refuses to even take the letter seriously, but he dies by falling off a drop into an open mine. Joseph's death is also ruled a suicide. John inherited the property, and he had had no issue until the current time of the story, 1887, when he receives the same thing. Letter, pips, instructions, signature. The only clue John has is a portion of an unburned paper, which has a list of basically numbers and names on it. When Holmes contemplates what all this means, he suggests John wastes no time in placing the one paper in the box and putting the box on the sundial, and then Sherlock will join John later. For readers from the United States, KKK is immediately significant. That is one of the interesting things about this selection. Holmes, and therefore Doyle's, explanation of the infamous Ku Klux Klan and legends about it when slavery was abolished by the Lincoln administration. You can go to paragraph 134 for the full British explanation definition of the KKK. In this instance, it is determined by Holmes that Elias had been a leader in the KKK, had ordered murders using the five orange pips as a calling card, and then been hunted in the same way for those murders. Or perhaps more so that Elias had paperwork and information which could damage powerful people in the United States, which the Klan members wanted at any cost. 
Burning those papers had been an act of defiance that not only damned Elias, but his brother Joseph and his nephew John as well. The second interesting and unique thing about this piece is that Holmes does not solve the mystery in time. John is killed that very evening. This is only one of a few times in which Holmes is slow or stumped. Most often, he is portrayed to be such an ingenious that he is always right and always ahead of the game. He had estimated, based on the letters and time frames in the past murders, that they had a day or two when John had no time at all. To at least bring justice to the murderers, since John and Joseph had done nothing to deserve death, Holmes continues his research. Via much digging and deduction typical of Holmes, he discovers the culprit, Captain James Calhoun of a ship named the Lone Star. Sherlock sends Calhoun an envelope with five pips in order to make him nervous until Sherlock can coordinate with the police to have Calhoun arrested for murder once back in port. In this instance, nature takes care of it herself. The Lone Star and all of its people are lost at sea. With this selection, Doyle addresses the darkness that is the terrorist organization, the Ku Klux Klan, demonstrates that Holmes is human and makes mistakes too, and gives the reader something to think about regarding terrorism, racism, and just desserts. At the end of the piece, the reader questions the legacy one leaves behind and the idea that sometimes karma seems tangible and real. We have several symbols with this piece, seeds, sundial, a shiny box of secrets. We have a conflict of person versus society, as well as person versus person, and at the very end, person versus nature. And our theme is to be conscious of what we do to others and what we leave behind. Thanks so much for checking out a production of Kendrick Curriculum by Lisa M. Kendrick. Be sure to take a moment to hit like and subscribe. Thanks so much for listening.